need to be pre slight pre slight Catch that chicken! That's it! That's it, that chicken! Get that chicken! Get the chicken! Come on, that's it! Well, what a turnaround of fortunes for the World Wrestling Federation in the five years since the 94 Royal Rumble, which I covered here on this channel two weeks ago. But as we head into 99, things are looking great for the WWF. Ratings and attendance are at an all-time high in the midst of the Attitude Era, thanks in large part to what Steve Austin and Mr. McMahon are doing with their bitter feud. But there is more to the company than that. Of course, on the famous January 4th edition of Raw, competing against the finger poke of doom on Nitro, Mankind won the the world title in one of the best feel-good moments of all time, in my opinion. A moment made infamous by Tony Schiavone saying that'll put butts in the seats on WCW and of course that's the night the channels change and the rest is really history. The tide is definitely turning toward the Federation's favor and uh, this show is definitely emblematic of all the things that are working well for the company at that time, that being McMahon versus Austin, as we head toward the 1999 Royal Rumble pay-per-view on January 24th at the Arrowhead Pond in Anaheim, California. This show was nominated by Rob G, Thomas R. McMillan, Sam Adelaide, Ken Terminated by DQ, and Ethan Martin over on Patreon.com slash Wrestling With Regret. Of course, one of the biggest legacies this show has, besides the two main event matches, which we'll get to, is the show's official theme, No Chance in Hell, which was coincided with Vince saying that Austin had no chance in hell of winning the Rumble match. Vince and Man had no theme music prior to this show, but this was the official song for the pay-per-view, and then once it wrapped up, Vince took that song as his own, where he kept it for ever since. Like, it's the one theme song he's ever had. They didn't even have him come out to the cover track from that Forcible Entry album. This is by far one of the most consistent themes ever in the modern era of wrestling, and it all got its start at this show. Now, this show is very near and dear to my heart, of course. By this point, I was a huge wrestling fan, but only for a little less than a year at this point. So I was a young 14-year-old, and I was just so full of markish fervor over the McMahon Austin story. Storyline. I believed a lot of stuff that we saw on TV at that time was real. Yes, I am not ashamed to admit that. But I was really hyped up for this storyline and this pay-per-view. Uh, I didn't have to watch too many of the Raws going into this because my memory of that time is pretty airtight. But I will say I did watch the Go Home Raw before this just to get a little bit of uh, catching up before the pay-per-view. And man, that has got to be one of the most chaotic, Rousseauiest episodes of Raw of all time. You got three matches ending in DQ, one of which is a hard core rules match. We get the infamous angle with Mark Henry and Sammy, the man in drag. Patterson and Briscoe fight China in a two-on-one match that includes a totally random walk-on by Sable who gets beat up by Luna and also features the Stooges feeling up China when she's been blinded by powder. And that's not all because before this episode we also saw the Ministry of Darkness have its humble beginnings which began with the Undertaker slitting his wrist on television and pouring the blood into the goblet and making Dennis Knight drink the blood and then he became Midian. This stuff right now, it's absolutely Absolutely, Vince Russo at his Russoiest. 14,800 folks in the pond in Anaheim, 650,000 pay-per-view buys, makes this the second highest number ever in the pre-network era for the Rumble, only to be beaten in 2002. Michael Cole and Jerry Lawler on commentary for this one. JR is on medical leave to address his recent bout of Bell's palsy. We'll see him as a heel soon again, though. Your opening matchup, a non-title affair as the new hardcore champ, the Road Dog, takes on one half of the tag champions, the Big Boss Man. Gotta love the Road Dog's opening spiel. You see, I'm a hardcore fish in a big pond, and I'm hardcore for life until I D-I-E, and that's no L-I-E. God, it's so bad. One of the first lines of commentary during this match is bringing up the boss man, how he's one half of the champs with Ken Shamrock on the corporation team, and they bring up how boss man and Shamrock are set to defend the titles against Owen Hart and Jeff Jarrett the next night on Raw, so thanks for reminding me a very boring tag title reigns coming up in the very near future. The two trade taunts early on. The boss man takes over and does his own version of Suck it. Where's it at? DX, suck it! Bossman throwing himself into the top turnbuckle. Road Dog makes his comeback. Bossman teasing the nightstick and paying dearly for it with ring post-itis. Oh shit, Bossman with his own Judas effect. A couple minutes later, he spits on Road Dog, which is gross. I love the sign advertising the Mick Foley fan page on tripod.com. Those are the days. Bossman's got Dog in the bear hug. Looks like he's dancing with him for a second. The Bossman undoes Chekhov's turnbuckle pad as he continues to work Road Dog over. Dog finds an opening where he throws Bossman off the top rope. Does his shaking and his wobbling, then Boss Man just catches him with the Boss Man slam and wins. That's it, huh? 
I give it two stars out of five. It was a fairly straightforward opening matchup here. Good face, good heel going at it. And that's pretty much all there was to it. They kept saying on commentary throughout, like, boy, if this were a hardcore rules match, things would be very different here for these two. But they say it so much, all it did was make me think, oh yeah, it might have been better if it were a hardcore rules match. The way they just talked about it endlessly made me think like, you didn't have to do that. You could have booked yourself out of that some other way. Our next match sees for the Intercontinental Championship, Ken Shamrock defending against badass Billy Gunn. One of the big stories going into this feud is a couple weeks ago on Raw, Mr. Ass shook his namesake in front of a woman in the front row of the crowd who was revealed to be Ken Shamrock's kayfabe sister, real life girlfriend, yes that is weird, Ryan Shamrock. Billy is on the offensive early in the match, it's a nice stalling suplex. Gunn runs his shoulder into the ring post, then Ken just kicks him in the ass repeatedly while going, oh! 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 Shamrock taking over. Nice spinning heel kick. He telegraphs a move though. Billy hits him with the Famouser, which actually isn't called that yet. Action spills to the outside. Lots of brawling here. On the apron, they get into a very unnatural position to fight before Billy throws Ken face first into the announce table. Back in the ring, Shamrock attacks the leg. Nice fisherman suplex. A little do -si do leads to Tim White getting his clock clean, which leads to a triple down. In comes Val Venus, who's also feuding with Ken at this moment. He plants Shamrock with a DDT. A slow crawl and we barely get a kick out. He goes up top but he gets none of it. Hurts the ankle that Ken's been working all match. Ken gets the ankle lock and Billy taps. Ken retains. I thought it was a fine match. These two had some aggression that was definitely on display here and I think it worked to their advantage. My one problem was it didn't feel like there was much of like a real story being told in this thing until maybe the halfway point. Once things begin to slow down and Billy's leg becomes more part of like the, the action here because before that these two were just kind of basically trading moves back and forth and no one's really selling or really registering from what I observed here. I like the fact that Ken is kind of double dipping into different uh, feuds right now. He's mad at Billy, he's mad at Val Venus, and of course nothing about this is going to stay consistent between now and Wrestlemania. Whatever ideas you may have about the Intercontinental Championship scene here is going to drastically change by Mania 15. Shane McMahon's backstage pumping up his dad for the Rumble match, but then we go to a European title match as X-Pac takes on Gangrel. Gangrel, that gothic lifestyle of his, not really much to this match in terms of a story. It was just announced on TV, hey, Gangrel's got a European championship match against X-Pac. And here we go. Nice opening exchange with the two. X-Pac with his little flip and the slam. Running attack in the corner misses. Gangrel takes over, drops his opponent on the top rope. Great sell by X-Pac here. X-Pac fights out of a headlock, then gets launched into the air. Pac comes back, hits the corner, punches. Third match in a row we've seen that spot. Hits the Bronco Buster. X-Pac with a top rope cross body. They can't quite roll through into the cover. Referee Teddy Long absolutely counts the three, but it does not count, and they just keep going. The fans chant, you fucked up. Gangrel goes goes for a slam, but X-Pac counters with the X-Factor to win and retain, and why would you show the replay of the bad three count if you didn't have a good explanation for what happened? This one gets one and a half stars out of five for me. Kind of disappointing to watch this match now, because I think 14-year-old me, I think, was probably the most hyped for this match out of anything else in the undercard uh, besides the WWF Championship match, because I loved Gangrel, thought he had one of the coolest gimmicks. I loved X-Pac and the whole fiery baby face, the underdog gimmick he had going. I loved this feud with D'Lo Brown over the European Championship the previous year. So yeah, this one was kind of a disappointment for me in the past and the present. Backstage, Kevin Kelly is with DX. They're debating who's going to win the Rumble, who will claim the $100,000 bounty on Stone Cold. Triple H wraps it up by saying it's every man for themselves, and China butts in saying, and woman. Back in the arena, Shane McMahon comes to the ring with some weird music. He introduces Luna, who's challenging Sable for the women's title up next. Shane saying that Sable has suffered a chronic back injury as a a result of what happened on Heat, and he wants Sable to come out and relinquish the women's title, as he says. Sable comes out and simply says, ring the bell. No pop. So we go to that match now. It's a strap match for the Women's Championship as Sable defends against her longtime rival, Luna. Sable strikes first with the strap, yoinks Luna into the ring post, choking her and stuff. Luna cuts Sable off as she tries to touch the corners and takes over. Sable Mountain a comeback. Back to the whipping she goes. It's her primary move in this match besides kicking. Luna goes to the back again. She's wearing Sable like a backpack as she touches the corners. Sable is touching the turnbuckles behind her. Nice backflip spot here. Shay McMahon gets up from commentary and distracts the referee. Suddenly, that fan comes in and lays out Luna, allowing Sable to touch the last corner and win to retain. 
I give this one a half star out of five. This match, there wasn't much to it, but hey, thanks to Luna, they didn't shit the bed. I don't think anyone really understood what this relationship with Shane McMahon and Luna was, least of all WWF, because they abandoned this, this part of the angle pretty soon after what we saw on this show here. Of course, uh, Tori, the woman who attacked Luna here, was the crazed stalker Sable super fan we've been seeing on TV in the weeks leading up to this. And then the relationship would take a turn soon after this, where Sable turns heel on Tori and kind of, you know, Tori sees the error in her ways and just how evil of a woman Sable is, leading to their terrible women's championship match at WrestleMania 15. Backstage, corporate members, boss man, Test, and Ken Shamrock discuss strategy. You guys, it's every man for himself in the Royal Rumble match. Also, I got a feeling 1999 is going to be my year. Well, folks, this next match, the semi-main event of the show, this is a match that whether you've never seen it before, whether you've watched it one time or twice or a dozen times, and why would you, it is a very brutal, difficult match to watch. I'm talking about the I Quit match for the WWF Championship as mankind defends against the Rock. This is the latest match in their epic title feud that began at Survivor Series 98 when The Rock turned heel and joined the corporation to win the vacant championship. Of course, I talked earlier in the review about the January 4th Raw when Mick Foley won the belt, and I will say this, personally for me, is probably one of the most inspiring moments of my life as a wrestling fan, seeing Mick Foley win the championship. Michael Cole, you know, who gets a lot of flack for how he sounds and how he acts at this point in his career, but man, him doing the call for Mankind winning for the first time. That was just, I think, one of the top calls of Cole's career, I think, in his entire run in WWE so far. Um, it was just, it was magical. As, as a young fan, as somebody who, like, you know, I think fully winning the belt, to me, was one of the biggest seed-planting moments for me thinking, you know, it kind of inspiring me to get into the business and just, you know, the whole dream of defying those who tell you you can't do it. And I think that was a really positive message for me. And uh, yeah, I mean, Mick Foley's championship win, it was just aces as far as I'm concerned. So Mankind tricks The Rock into making their rematch at the Rumble an I Quit match. And as a kid and also now watching this back in the present, I loved the build for this match. I thought it was really smart and really well done because The Rock appears to be in this completely unwinnable situation. How how can he possibly beat a man who got blown up in Japan, who lost an ear in Germany, who spilt so much blood and all these concussions and injuries and has never once said I quit, has never once given up in a match, this and that. Like, how is The Rock going to survive against this maniac and regain the championship? It just can't be done, as seemingly at least. How does it feel to be in a match that you can't win and I can't lose? Every odd is seemingly against The Rock, but he tries to level the playing field because earlier on Heat, Mr. Mc man puts mankind in a warm-up match against a returning Mabel. That's how The Rock run in and the two beat up the champion here. As the match starts off, you see a sign saying The Rock or Brit Jabroni. The match begins with fists flying. Mankind dinks Rock with a microphone. On the outside, Foley doing his horrifying trademark bump into the steps. Rock gets on the headset and talking some trash. Mankind fights back. Another Mike dink. Sokka is out when we get the mandible claw. Mankind vows to split open that ridiculous eyebrow and now the fight makes its way to the crowd, Rock with a power slam on the floor. He grabs the ring bell, but instead of hitting Mankind with it, he just holds it up to his head and rings it and sings a song. That was pretty funny. They go to the announce table for the Rock Bottom, and whoops, down goes the table. Going up the aisle, fighting in the tech area, Rock with a DDT on the concrete, but Mick still won't quit. Rock brings in a ladder, but it backfires. What do you say, Rock? Oh, you piss yourself. Elbow drop is missed, and Mankind splats on the ladder. They climb the ladder up to an area in front of the crowd above the floor. Mankind is hit and thrown into some big electrical boxes, causing all these sparks to fly. Cuts the lights in the arena. What a visual. It's not King of the Ring 98, but it's still pretty wild. These apparently dangerous electrical circuit boxes are being moved with no problem by the crew who aren't wearing any special gear. Shane McMahon even tells Rock to stop with the corporate champ refusing to let up here. Rock drags Foley back to the ring, grabs some handcuffs, proceeds to handcuff the champion. Mankind's a sitting duck and starts to bleed, but he takes Rock to Dick Kick City and it bites a forehead. Rock with the clothesline to take him down, though. He grabs a chair, proceeds to do the people's elbow onto it. Foley tells Rock to go to hell. Rock says you first, then proceeds to dink Foley in the head 11 times in a row with a steel chair. And this is just so hard to watch, and it's even harder to watch when you realize after seeing the film beyond the match that Mick Foley's wife and children who I don't think either of them are above the age of six are, are sitting there in the front row watching this 
as it happens. I mean, it is just heartbreaking and blood curdling to watch. The Rock hits him in the back of the head with it as the kill shot on the ramp. Then you got Rock standing over Foley. He puts the mic to his mouth. Suddenly we hear the sound of mankind screaming. He quits and The Rock is declared the winner. We would later find out though that this was the result of some corporate chicanery because on heat before the show, mankind was cutting a promo where he says, I will not say the words, I quit, I quit, I quit. And they took that snippet and they played that back on the PA system to make it sound like Mankind had actually said it when that was not the actual case. But nevertheless, the call stands. The Rock stands tall as the new WWF champion two times now to his credit. I'm going to give this one three and a half stars out of five. I will say, Mick Foley's overall performance in this one, the amount of punishment he sustains, I mean, if you don't include the, the excessive chair shots, everything he takes up to that point, the falling onto the electrical circuits, the spots on the concrete and everything, I, and it shows his defiance and his ungodly level of Toughness and you know the way the rock looks at the end of this thing looks like a complete evil son of a bitch. Uh, so getting that across, I think, was expertly done. It was a visceral level of contempt, you know, you as you feel watching this matchup. And again, as a, a very impressionable 14-year-old fan, this match broke my heart. And like it just it messed with me for the whole rest of the night. I was so downhearted that my hero McFoley was beaten in this very obviously phony way, or phony in that kind of uh, disingenuous genuous, dishonest way, dishonorable way by The Rock. Because even then I could tell, oh, wasn't that sound kind of familiar to Heat? And so you know that going into it and you're so mad, but also just the, the physical toll this match takes is so hard to step back and look at because apparently, uh, according to Foley, they were only agreeing on five chair shots to the head, but by the time they hit number five, Mick was still in the ring. So they had to like go out to the ramp for this dramatic ending here, which explains why there were more of them. So, you know, Foley would receive a lot of stitches in his head for what happened here. He was likely concussed. And again, the trauma that his family suffered seeing that live and in person was uh, pretty hard to, to stomach as well. But I mean, again, as a fight, as a story of fully trying to come back and being this tough SOB, I think that was very well communicated, even without all the extra chair shots. But enough about that, folks. Time to talk about the main event of this show. And the reason a lot of people tuned in to watch this event, it's Steve Austin versus Mr. McMahon and 28 other so-and-sos in the 1999 Royal Rumble match. Of course, this match is just basically an extension of that feud. Vince, as we all know, is damn sick and tired, sick and tired, damn, damn sick and tired of seeing Austin walk around with the championship belt. So we get a whole recap of this feud. Vince screws Austin out of the championship at breakdown and keeps him away from the belt for several months at this point. He gives Austin a shot to enter the Rumble match if he beats The Undertaker in a buried alive match at rock bottom, which he does. McMahon says there is no chance in hell Austin's going to win this Rumble match and he ensures that by placing Austin at number one in the Rumble and also placing a $100,000 bounty on his head for any wrestler who eliminates Austin in this matchup. Vince even makes himself number 30 to put salt on the wound, but Commissioner Shawn Michaels changing things up and makes Vince number two instead. This, of course, gives us some of the best rumble hype of all, and that is the series of vignettes in which Shane McMahon training his dad Vince for the rumble match, which includes him chasing a chicken in the snow, punching raw meat, and throwing some mass developmental guys out of a practice ring. One of these masked guys is most definitely Kurt Angle, by the way. I'll tell you what, folks, I just turned 30 years old this month. I have a quarter century of wrestling fandom behind me and so much knowledge and trivia and moments buried deep into my skull. But there is one thing for as long as I live, I will never ever forget. And that is the closing moments of the episode of Heat before this pay-per-view where Vincent Mann's getting his body oiled up and he says, look at my body. That's not baby oil. That's man oil. Yeah. So we have numbers one and two here, Austin and McMahon. The bell rings and Stone Cold is all over Vince from the word go. And the crowd is absolutely loving this. He's beating the hell out of Mr. McMahon here, but he really wants to milk this for all it's worth, taking his time with this beating. But he doesn't have too long to celebrate because in comes Golga at number three from the oddities. Hands like this, hands like this. Golga attacks Austin, but is soon dumped to the outside. McMahon flees the ring and Austin is in hot pursuit of the crowd. Some great signs you see on the way up. I may hardcore porn champ, McMahon's on juice, look mom, Dara, we're white trash. At number four is Draws, the LOD, who stands in the ring for a good long time by himself. By the way, they say it's 90 second increments between competitors. 
Forget that, there is zero consistency. Some of these things feel like 30 seconds have passed, others feel like two minutes have passed. There is no regularity with the time between participants in the Rumble match this year. So anyway, as Draws is in the ring by himself, Austin has been lured into a bathroom on the outside and the corporation beat him down. Number five is Edge and the action resumes at number six, Gilberg. Gilberg, and he's out. Back in the shitter, Austin is now a heap on the floor as the corporate team make their way out. Number seven is Steve Muff fucking Blackman. My apologies for not saying it right the last time. Number eight, the gray sweaty man himself and the owner of the best theme of all time, Dan the Beast Severn. He recently turned on Steve Blackman a couple weeks before this on Heat. They would have a little feud. They had one match, I think, on Raw after this, and this was pretty much the end of Severn's time in the World Wrestling Federation. We cut to the back, and Austin is being carted away as Lawler tries to explain the difference in semantics between a trap and a plan, it's number nine, Tiger Ali Singh. Oh no, I feel there's a video coming about this guy in the future. We are spending so little time in the ring at this point. Can they not handle a split screen? Number 10 is the blue guy, the blue meanie. Number 11's time is here, but no one comes out at first. We cut to the back and see Headbanger and Mosh getting beat up by Mabel, who we saw earlier on Heat. Looks like Mabel is taking his place. Cole calls him 500 pounds of meanness. Mabel's on an eliminating spree and almost empties the ring himself when Road Dog enters at number 12. The roadie takes out Edge, but then the lights cut out. Undertaker's newly formed Ministry of Darkness has arrived and Midian and the Acolytes beat Mabel up and take him out of the match. Taker appears at the front of the ramp before Mabel and says something to him before the goons beat him up again. Soon Mabel will be reincarnated as Viscera of the Ministry of Darkness. Number 13, pulling double duty is Gangrel. I will always pop for these guys in the front row who sway back and forth to his music. Gangrel is in fact eliminated in quick fashion. Good lord, a lot of dead time in this match. Number 14 is Kurgan and his ridiculous hat. Hands like this! Hands like this! Number 15 is Al Snow, who was without his friend Head. He was purloined by Goldust a couple weeks ago. He's eliminated. In comes Goldust at number 16, who is also not with Head. Wouldn't it have been nice to continue this angle here and have the two of them, you know, like, interact in the ring since they have a feud going on? Number 17 is The Godfather. Number 18 is Kane. He is an unwilling member of the corporate team at this point. He's basically constantly threatened with being uh, committed and sent back to the insane asylum should he disobey their orders. But Kane is on a huge streak here. He eliminates a bunch of people, clearing out the ring before the white coats show up to take Kane to the insane asylum. Kane beats up the orderlies, eliminates himself, and flees through the crowd. The ring is once again empty as Ken Shamrock arrives at number 19. Mr. McMahon is shown back up and joins the announce desk. The one booted Billy Gunn limps his way to the ring at 20 to try and get revenge on Ken from earlier. Ken going after that leg yet again though. Number 21 is corporate member test, but hey, we haven't seen the outside of the arena in a whole five or 10 minutes. What's going on out there? We see the Ministry of Darkness stuffing Mabel into a hearse as an ambulance makes its way to the arena and it's stone cold at the wheel. Austin's back in the arena and Vince's acting here is just great. Austin walks his way back to the ring as the big boss man comes in at number 22. Austin chases Vince, then gets stomped by Shamrock as Vince goes back to the desk and Shamrock is soon gone. Number 23 is Triple H. And at this point, I'm going, why doesn't everyone just gang up on Stone Cold simultaneously at this point? It just goes on for a long time where there's really no group beatdown. And you would think with a $100,000 bounty, everyone will try and work to eliminate him Big Show style, but that does not happen in this match. Number 24 is Val Venus. Austin eliminates Billy Gunn. Number 25 is X Pac. Number 26, Sexual Chocolate Mark Henry. Number 27, Rest Wrestling's most employed man, Jeff Jarrett. X-Pac laying out Triple H with a heel kick that no one really sells. And I get that it's supposed to be every man for himself in the Rumble match, but this is the first time all match that someone beats up their own teammate and like no one discusses this. Number 28 is D'Lo Brown, accompanied by PMS, who've got him over a barrel after D'Lo was accused of causing Terry to lose her fake baby. Austin throws Test out, boss man hurls X-Pac out. Vince's voice getting more desperate as the odds of Austin winning slowly increase. I don't care who wins. I'll be happy to pay anybody $100,000. Jared gets thrown out by the H-Man as Owen Hart is number 29. Austin takes a moment to grab a pitcher of water from the announce desk, throw it in Vince's face. Finally, at number 30 is China, the first woman to ever compete in the Royal Rumble match. She earned the spot by beating Vince in the Corporate Rumble a couple weeks ago, which also featured some DX members. A week after embarrassing him on Raw with Sammy, she gets her shots in on Mark Henry, throws him out of the ring, but then Austin dumps her out. Triple H eliminates Val. Austin takes out the H-Man. Owen goes to eliminate Austin, but he gets thrown out instead. Your final four are Austin, 
D'Lo, Bossman, and Vincent Mann, not pictured. D'Lo with a lowdown on Austin, but Bossman throws him out. Austin eliminates Bossman, and now it's down once again to Austin and McMahon. An awesome moment here where Vince is selling the fear, then it's hit with something from the back from the audience. They brawl on the table, they make their way to the crowd, and back, Austin dinks McMahon. Back in the ring, Vince hits Austin with a low blow. Austin comes back, hits the stunner, but Stone Cold still isn't done. Out comes The Rock, who goads Austin into the ropes. That allows Vince to dump Austin out of the ring. Vincent Mann has won the Royal Rumble match. Vince, Shane, and the Stooges all celebrate as the show wraps up. If you look at this match solely as a chapter in the Austin McMahon feud and like nothing else, then it was a fine chapter. I think it was a great story told of Austin, you know, fighting back against everything Vince has thrown at him, only to still get eliminated in the end. By the way, young 14-year-old Brian Zane was fucking pissed at the end of this show. Oh my God, between the I Quit match and Vince cheating to win the Rumble, that ruined the rest of my day. It almost ruined my entire week going back to school and talking about it. It was just not a fun time to be a fan for me, but it's still a brilliant piece of storytelling and I think that was really well done. But if you look at the Royal Rumble match as a Rumble match, it's the shits. Cause you know, there's no one else in this match of the 30 guys who could conceivably win this thing besides Austin McMahon and go on to WrestleMania. It's just not going to happen with any of these people. So that's one thing. Also, the ring is empty for a lot of this matchup or it just has one guy in it. Like, wow, what an exciting rumble match this is. Where half of it we see, we cut to the outside and see what's happening with Austin and the ambulance and the stretcher and everything. If you just go into it wanting a good old fashioned Royal Rumble match, you're not really going to get a good one here. So that's the, the trade off you get with focusing on one simple angle with this. Of course, some wrongs would be corrected soon after. Austin would be put in that cage match with Vincent Mann at St. Valentine's Day Massacre, the review of which I hope to get unblocked one of these days so you can hear me talk about it. Also, Mankind would steal the bounty money that was given to The Rock as his reward. He would throw it out into the crowd and he would use that as leverage to get one more title rematch at Halftime Heat, where he would regain the title in an empty arena match. My grade for the 1999 Royal Rumble pay-per-view is a C+. It's a little bit better than the 94 Rumble, which I covered two weeks ago, but not by much. Much. And I think that one of the common threads between the two of them is a very meager undercard. I think that with this show, it's Austin McMahon, it's Mankind Rock, and who cares about anyone else on this show? It really could have been anyone else coming out for those matches, and it wouldn't have made a lick of difference uh, for the most part. And again, the, the I Quit match, it was captivating until it wasn't, until it was just really sickening to watch. And also the Royal Rumble match, it was a nice piece of business, nice piece of storytelling, but only for two guys and pretty much everyone else they could have fucked right off. And so it's just a really, it's, it's a tale of two shows basically. There's some, there's a little bit of good. The Rumble match is kind of what everyone wants to see in the Rumble pay-per-view. And so if the match is good or if it's bad, that can really dictate the rest of the overall score on a show such as this. When there's so few undercard matches, you can really include as well. So yeah, this was, you know, during a time when, you know, the company really could do no wrong with ratings and attendance and everything. Their pay-per-views still struck out every once in a while, or there were some missteps. Not saying this is a terrible show, um, but again, if the undercard were a bit better and had a little more star power to it, if they hadn't put all their eggs in like four specific baskets, then I think it would be telling a different story. Well, I hope you enjoyed this review and this look back through memory lane for me, going back through my formative first several months as a young, impressionable wrestling fan. What did you think of this show? Let me know in the comment section below. And of course, if you haven't yet, folks, do subscribe to the channel and click on the bell icon to get all the notifications from right here at Wrestling With Regret. Of course, in two weeks, we go back to the classic reviews. We go back to the year 92, WCW. What a time to be alive if you're a wrestling fan. Of course, I've covered a lot of WCW 92 shows, but I haven't covered this next one yet. And since it's February, it's only appropriate. We're covering Super Brawl 92. But until then, folks, I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.